Hello, assalamu alaikum everybody. Hope you're all safe, sound and healthy. And I'm going to talk about three main topics. But before I forget any of them, um, let me begin with one, which is um, or when I was preparing, you know, for this podcast episode, um, I was listening to Muid Birzada because he, um, after many days, actually, I was listening to him today. Um, and he sort of has initiated a debate where he's talking about ratings. Um, and he's saying that, you know, um, overall the anchors or the channels should not be blamed um, for, you know, showing, um, you know, for sensationalizing a news and for being a sort of a tabloid. Um, here, I actually, first of all, want to start with that because this is something I really need to, this is something that I have touched upon in my previous um, episodes and in, um, you know, on social media also, this is the topic that I've talked about as a writer and as somebody who has been related to um, the media. Um, the, and also somebody who has a degree in journalism. Um, let me tell you one thing. Um, this is something I've always said before, that as a writer, we have a duty and a responsibility. Similarly, the media has a duty and a responsibility. The media is not just here to cater to, um, you know, being an entertainment. They need to understand there is a difference between journalism and entertainment. And in Pakistan, unfortunately, as in America and in other countries, but in Pakistan, I'm going to talk about Pakistan, unfortunately. Um, even when I was teaching um you know postgraduate students when i was teaching them the art or the craft of script writing um we had one of the huge issues that we had um is that the tft department the, the television film and theater department um lacked equipment that was essential that was necessary um for filmmaking why because all that equipment was with the journalism department. Pray tell, why the frack does the journalism department, which is essentially mass comm, um, why does it need equipment that is the um, fundament, the basics required for, um, for television or for entertainment and for, you know, uh, when it comes to entertainment form of media. Um, so the problem here is that I also noticed this a lot um, that, you know, our so-called um, really big um, news channels, they used that equipment. I could see that because the way they would, you know, um, work on their production level, you're giving the news, your anchors are having talk shows. You don't need such hi-fi uh, you know, entertainment value backgrounds. You don't need such, um, you, you're not creating a film. You're not part of the film industry. This is not a film. This is not fiction. This is reality. So when you're trying to merge the art of filmmaking, the art of fictional narrative as a backdrop or as the whole, you know, scenic view that you're sort of creating, the frame that you're cre making um, for an anchor or a newscaster, then to me that is bad form, okay, that is absolutely bad form. You can't do that, or even if you can, I don't care if you can, the point is you shouldn't do that, right? You're not supposed to do that. There is a clear differentiation between the two, and I should know because I am actually qualified in both the fields. I have qualifications in journalism, and I am qualified as a script writer and producer in the entertainment arena. So these two um, should not be merged the way they have been merged. Um, so basically, journalism in Pakistan has emerged from yellow journalism to tabloid and from tab tabloid to, um, you know, outright, uh, you know, Bollywood. That is wrong. So yeah, um, as, as the media's job is not just to cater to, um, you know, uh, 
creating drama or entertainment for the public just to attract them for their ratings. But the media's job and responsibility is also to educate. Okay, so that is not an excuse. So although I understand what Moit Pirzada is trying to say, but the point is I have actually covered this way before, way, way, way before, and time and again, repeatedly, off and on, I have talked about this, that this is not an excuse. Yes, you have to blame the, the media. Yes, you have to blame the channels. Yes, you have to blame the anchor persons and the journalists. Yes, you have to blame them. Why? Because at the end of the day, ratings are essentially your business. You understand? It's business. And in journalism, business has become priority. And that is why journalism is dead. Okay, in any nation, the first step towards the demise of quality journalism or real journalism or true journalism is when you bring ratings, when you bring business. Okay, so when you start prioritizing ratings, and although you claim that those ratings are prioritized in the sense of the content, um, then listen. That is also wrong because at the end of the day, you are not looking at the content. You are looking at what cheap circus trick you did. You know, what cuss word um, you, you let the politicians give or, you know, what dog fight, you know, ensued in your program or in your show that sensationalized the whole thing that attracted the audience because the audience is essentially what we refer to as the mash bean. The mash bean are spectators. Um, spectators who just love to see a spectacle going on in front of them. I always refer to our people as spectators. And I'm glad to see I'm not the only one because this is a fact that people must have realized by now. And that is essentially the reason also why Pakistan is doomed. Because our people are spectators. They just love to see a dog fight. They love to see a cat fight. They just love to see a brawl. They love to, you know, go on and see, oh, what's what's going to happen now? Oh, what's going to happen now? And, you know, and, and they, and, you know, God be damned. I'm sorry, but that's exactly how it seems. It's like, you know, everybody be damned, God be damned, you know, the whole world be damned. You know, let's just have our two minute, two bit or two minute worth of fun. And that is pathetic. But again, you cannot blame the public for that. This is something that after all, you began feeding to the public. You began feeding that flesh of swine. And now they're addicted to it. So it it is definitely the media's fault. Okay, so I mean, there was a time when our media was more responsible. When we had only two to three channels, our media was actually more responsible. There were some lines, some boundaries. There was quality journalism. There were certain limitations, restrictions. You know, there was that fine line between entertainment and a journalism that was not crossed. And our media took the responsibility of awareness and education, yes. And I loved it for that, okay? I don't care what these pseudo-intellectuals talk about. And I'm sorry, I'm not talking about Moit Pirzada here. I'm thinking about some other pseudo-intellectuals who are part of the media industry um, and who are part of the entertainment and the media industry and who talk big talks about how PTV, you know, brainwashed people. You know what? I'd rather have that PTV brainwash, brainwashing going on than what... Um, BS, you you know, cropping out now, okay? Because that brainwash was good brainwash. That was nothing negative. If PTV indeed brainwashed the public, they brainwashed them towards education, towards responsibility, towards, um, you know, deep stories. They had depth in the, in their dramas, and they tried to motivate people towards positivity and good vibes, okay? Thank you very much. At the same time, at the same time, they highlighted all the issues. And today, when you're not brainwashed, how many of you are actually highlighting all the issues? 
both in the entertainment as well as in the journalism media tell me in both platforms who is highlighting what's actually going on so yeah i rest my case right here because uh, or else i'll forget the other two things that i i need to talk about and one is in in a way it's sort of related to my argument here um but anyway the thing is now we have uh, Maulana Tariq Jameel. Now Maulana Tariq Jameel is, um, you know, a nationwide uh, renowned, um, you know, um, call him a religious scholar, okay? And he's he's actually known internationally as well. And now today there was this sad, tragic news about the death of his son. And it is a very, very clear-cut case of how his son was shot to death. And and just look again. This is why I'm talking about, you know, spectators and drama and and about, you know, the responsibility of the media and the law enforcement agencies. Now, the police is suddenly declaring that, oh, you know, it's suicide. Did you do an autopsy? Number one. Number two, how do you know at a glance that he shot himself in the chest while exercising, no less. Get your facts straight, get your stories straight. The fact that they don't even bother to get their narrative straight, you know, the fact that, th that they don't even bother to get their story straight, the fact that they don't even bother to create a chronology, you know, um, they just can't even be bothered. So that shows that they they really don't care they don't care that uh, that whether they're being believed or believable you know they don't care that you know people might question them they just don't care why because at the end of the day you know we are a colony of the US Pakistan's constitution Pakistan's um, legal framework does not exist anymore it's just on paper but in reality everything's out the window and now we are under the you know, under the uh, U.S. establishment, which means that, you know, everybody's working under the U.S. Um, framework, which says that the colony of, of you know, of the, the Pakistani colony of the U.S. Um, has no rights. It has no legal framework. It has nothing. So it's, it's you know, it's just a it's just a joke now. Everything is a joke. So the police are actually making these random speculations about his death when it is so obvious that he was killed. Number one, okay? Number two, can you please do your due diligence? I mean, we know that Nawaz Sharif and Mariam Nawaz, um, they have been targeting uh, Maulana Tariq Jamil. Why? Because he has been very open um, in his remarks concerning all the politicians he made a very simple remark in which he said um that you know that the that the way that they tried to uh talk about the iddat period um which is a period um of waiting that a woman observes after she has divorced uh, her husband or after she has been widowed and that is basically a period of 3 months um usually from of widowhood and you know it's it's basically a time period where a woman waits um before she can get married again okay and obviously um they created this false case that Imran Khan's current wife did not observe the waiting period before getting married to him first of all were you living with her were you there with her she is a religious woman herself and she is a religious scholar plus she is an mpbs doctor thank you very much she's no fool and she belongs to a very good um you know a very she belongs to a family that is of a, a very good social class social economic class okay what you might refer to as an elite family she belongs to a good family okay she's a lady and that is why you see that she can't even be bothered to give them it's like jemima all over again you know you have jemima and then you have bushra bibi both of these women attacked by mariam nawaz and her family 
both of these women um, who are showing their family background, they're showing what kind of family they belong to um, by not even bothering to respond. Imran Khan also shows what class he belongs to by not responding to anybody whenever they attack him or his character. Um, this is how you know what kind of a family background they have, as opposed to the family background of Nawaz Sharif or Zardari, um, you know, who are absolute pits. They're the absolute pits. As we know, this whole family of uh, Nawaz Sharif, the whole family from top to toe, um, they've been prostituting themselves and each other. They've been pimping others out within their family and around them. Their political members are known as drug smugglers. They themselves are actually behind those political members who are drug smugglers and who have prostitution and child pornography rings. And these are people who are behind sex trafficking and human trafficking. These are people who are behind... Uh, Drug abuse, I mean, the sudden surge of drugs, you know, drugs secretly being introduced to students in elementary level schools in the form of candies that are bought by their cafeterias or canteens. I mean, who do you think is behind it? It's this Nawashri's family and their minions, right? Who do you think is behind um, or all the pornography and, and the child prostitution and, and the uh, overall prostitution and sex trafficking. You know, you have Gilani um, from the People's Party, his family, and Zardari. And then you have Rana, um, who is a minion of Nawaz Sharif and his family. And, you know, and then you have, and they're also not just that, they're rapists. The amount of rape cases and the amount of sexual harassment cases and within their own party, as in the female members of Nawashri's political party have been, almost all of them have been victims of either rape or sexual harassment. So, I mean, tell me, what do you make of that? In fact, this is, this is that party where even... <clears throat> where they even talk against Maryam Nawaz behind her back and the vulgar words that they use. You know, you should sometimes just sit and listen to the language they use when they talk about Maryam Nawaz. So these are all people who came from filthy backgrounds. You know, they came from those kind of backgrounds where um, they have no sense of dignity, they don't know how to talk, they don't know how to walk, they don't know how to sit down. They suddenly come into so much money through corruption and, you know, through smuggling and through looting and, you know. I mean, these are the kind of people that America prefers and that America forces onto countries like ours. Why? So that countries like ours should not um, regain our total independence, you know, so that America should rule the world. And now we come to the next topic that, um, uh, you know, about Israel and Palestine. As you see, again, it's all as predicted. Everything is exactly as predicted. The world war that I've been saying for a long time that America basically has been egging the world towards the world war. You know, America has been desperate for the world war to begin on a full scale. And because, you know, it wasn't happening for a long time. They created the Gulf War. Um, you know, it sort of, again, fizzled out at the end because the whole world did not get involved. Um, then it created, um, you know, uh, the Balkan Wars. I mean, it went through with that. Then it interfered with Iraq. It inter tried to interfere with Iran uh, and failed miserably. Then it interfered with uh, the Middle East. It interfered with, uh, you know, the northern belt of Africa. Um, they interfered with, they tried to interfere with Russia a lot, but they couldn't get around to it. They tried to interfere with China, but they couldn't get around to it. And now they finally, they finally struck gold, they think by using Ukraine to initiate the war and then using that they try to subdue Pakistan right 
and on the other hand, they're working with India to continue to commit genocide against the Kashmiris in occupied Kashmir in India, right? And on the other hand, you've got again Palestine and Israel that had sort of come to a ceasefire, although I think that was BS really. What kind of a ceasefire? I mean, there was, that was not even a ceasefire because at the end of the day, um, Israel was using other underhanded means to continue with their genocide plan. You know, again, with the help, with the huge active help of the U.S. And, you know, all this money that the U.S. has been stealing from other countries like Pakistan and that your France has been stealing from Africa, you know, they've been pooling all that money and financing Israel throughout this time, in case you didn't know that. And now, um, when finally, you know, Israel, Israel uh, finally has, you know, trapped Palestine into this vicious uh, full-scale war, um, the Muslim world, because remember, America had already started attacking the Muslim world before in the name of uh, war against terror, um, which was a, a huge hoax, really. I mean, because everybody who has, you know, two cells to rub together in their brains would they they're aware of the fact that 9/11 was a false flag op, false flag operation um many senators spoke up about it many foreign ministers uh spoke up about it um many foreign intelligence agencies showed proof um, but obviously, you've got the ignorant fools in the Western world who now talk about brainwashed. They, as I've repeatedly said, even in my previous episodes, you want to know who's brainwashed? The European public and the American public. Now, they are brainwashed. They are the most ignorant people I have ever seen or met in the entire world. You know, I mean, imagine that they are so ignorant that they don't even know what the country next to them is or what the state next to them is, they have no clue. So how can these people talk about Israel and Palestine? They have no right to. They're so ignorant, and they're displaying their ignorance when they're talking about Israel and Palestine. They're displaying their ignorance when they talk about 9-11, and they're displaying their colossal ignorance when they're talking about Muslims. You know? So... I mean, you were brainwashed um, into committing genocide in other countries around the world. Um, you were brainwashed into financing Israel to invade and ethnically cleanse the natives of Palestine. You know, um, you were brainwashed to arm India to continue its genocide in occupied Kashmir. And you were brainwashed to applaud Burma in its genocide against its Muslims. So, I mean, you know, just look at yourselves. Um, European citizens and American citizens, just sit down for two minutes and just think about what you people have been doing or allowing your governments to do. And you're talking about democracy. Heck, your own government isn't democratic, you know. Have you ever sat down for two seconds and thought about the actual political status of your government? That have you actually ever even sat and thought about the fact that your government is also not really elected by you? You know, why would America allow its own people to have full control over who rules over them? Why? I mean, it doesn't allow other countries to do that. Why would it allow its own people to do that? No, that's not its policy. That never was. And if, if what happened to Obama didn't open your eyes, then you, you're doomed. I'm sorry, but you're doomed because of your own stupidity. I mean, how utterly blind are you not to realize the whole fiasco, you know, or the, the, that whole 
tug of war that was going on between Obama and the American establishment. It was so obvious, it was too obvious to ignore. Um, any idiot could see what was going on. And yet, uh, obviously, again, the American citizens are idiots because they didn't see what was going on. Um, but yeah, okay. And so here we have the Pakistani idiots, on the other hand, who are, you know, they, they just want to go on being spectators, you know, to see which dog is going to come and fight which dog next. Um, that they, you know, I mean, again, I have never seen a more shameless nation than the Pakistani nation. I mean, how shameless are you, seriously? That you seriously do not... I mean, what makes you think that Pakistan is going to last forever? I mean, that is, that is absolutely what I don't get. What on earth has made the people of Pakistan believe that no matter what happens, Pakistan shall remain forever? Pakistan has collapsed because of that unreasonable belief, because the people kept on thinking, oh, God is there and God will perform a miracle and Pakistan will survive. You know, that is the most stupid and the most ignorant and the most uneducated and the most un-Islamic statement I have ever heard in my entire life. That contradicts the whole spirit of Islam. That contradicts the very fundament of Islam. Look at Palestine. It's been fighting for 70 years. Do you see them getting anywhere close to their freedom? So what the hell made Pakistanis think that without fighting, without bloodshed, without any real revolution, a miracle would continue to make Pakistan to survive? You know, you were lucky to have one miracle in the form of Imran Khan. Look what happened to him. Because of your laziness and because of your mental, you know, your, ens your enslaved mentality, you know, you couldn't even save the man, you know, from being ousted and then going to jail. What did you do? You just rose in protest for one week and then suddenly, you know, everybody just didn't know what else to do. You know, I mean, again, it doesn't matter that the people of Pakistan are pissed off. It doesn't matter that they're boiling. It doesn't matter that they're raging. They are still not throwing sticks and stones at the politicians. I mean, how is the Pakistani uh, public reacting? By not going to their public gatherings, by, you know, ignoring them, by, uh, you know, just not giving two hoots. I mean, seriously? You think that that is going to help you? Listen, and also, also because the people think that, you know, um, they will refuse to vote, even if the elections are held, they will not vote. And, you know, they will show their power. What power? Did you even, I mean, seriously, what world are we living in? The only time Pakistanis actually, actually voted in the history of this country was once when they voted for Fatma Jinnah and then the army, which is began basically the U.S. fifth columnists in the form of the army, um, they stole, you know, they, they, they just stole it all and they refused and they rejected the public opinion and they forced Fatma Jinnah off, right? And then they even killed her. So that was the first time you could say that the people of Pakistan actually voted. And then now again, the second time that the people of Pakistan actually voted was when Imran Khan became prime minister. These are the two times in the history of Pakistan that the public actually voted. All the other so-called elections that ever took place in this country, they were rigged. Most of the voters do not even exist. Yes, they've, again, I'll repeat, most of the voters do not even exist. Those people, those number of people did not exist. Okay, now imagine that um, in one, from one, uh, you could say just from one city, right, um, or from one area, 
you get votes in that area, the total number of votes, if you count, uh, you know, the people living in that area. For example, the total number of votes are 4,000. And yet suddenly, during the elections from that very area, you're getting votes worth of 10,000 or 20,000. Yeah, where, where are all those votes coming from when the, when the entire population of that very area is just 4,000? So they have been rigging the elections for decades. And even the election um, where Imran Khan became prime minister, even that was rigged at the end of the day, whether you like to believe it or not. It is a fact that although they could not rig it 100%, so they couldn't stop him from being prime minister, but they could rig enough to stop him getting two-thirds majority. Right. Otherwise, actually, he did get two thirds majority if you counted our, uh, you know, if you counted our votes. So, again, who cares even if they do the elections? Because even if people don't vote or even if people vote for Imran Khan, how many times do you think they um, stole the votes, the, uh, you know, Imran Khan's votes? This is not the first time, technically speaking, that Imran Khan won when he became prime minister. He actually won all the previous times that he stood for the elections. He Yes, he actually won every single time he stood for the elections. But every single time, the people from the establishment, the army, they would come, they would take all the ballot boxes and they would take all the votes um, that belonged to Imran Khan and they would tell the uh, they would I literally tell um, the people who stood there you know the people who were in charge of the ballots that it's not his time yet we won't let him come and they would take all the votes away and they would dump them or set fire to them, or whatever. They would just discard them. And they would plant false votes for Nawaz Sharif, for Zardari, or whoever it was who had to come. So yeah, this is not actually the first time, technically, that Imran Khan won. He has won every single time he ran the elections. This was just the first time that it was so overwhelming that they couldn't 100% rig it. And so they had to allow him to come. And then they had already decided that, okay, let him become prime minister. We won't let him get two-thirds majority. And we will do to him what the American establishment did to Obama. We will not let him do his job. We will undermine every single policy and we will undermine every single work of his. And even if he does manage to get through and get some achievements, later on it doesn't matter. We're going to take the, you know, the credit anyway, because that's what Nawaz Sharif does. Nawaz Sharif has only ever taken credit for everything that has always been done by somebody else, especially by Imran Khan. He is so jealous of Imran Khan. He is so jealous of Imran Khan that he even now has to mimic the very pose Imran Khan makes, you know, to take a photograph. So he, he mimics his pose. Um, he mimics... He's the, you know, public gathering style. He mimics, uh, now they, you know, they used to, that is a very, very typical Paki thing, by the way, to do. It's a very typical Paki thing uh, where they make fun of somebody for doing something and then they go and do the exact same thing. Yeah, that is what Nawaz Sharif and his whole family, do. They, that's what they do. So, this is how um, I can, you know, best talk about what's going on. That America, as I've predicted before, is going to start a full-fledged war. You know, it has been egging that war. And now, as I'll again repeat my predictions, this war is actually going to cause the de very demise of America and Europe. Europe will collapse, and so will America. So Europe and America, who are behind these wars, and who are behind, uh, you know, the full-fledged world war that is going to start and is going to start very soon by the looks of things um they are the ones who are going to pay for it dearly 
because they have no idea what they've started. They are thinking that this world war will again enable them um, to regain you know, blatant power over the world. But the whole world is going to suffer because of their stupidity, like how Pakistan is suffering, like how Africa is suffering, um, like how even Europe, part of Europe, is already suffering. Um, so again, once again, people are going to suffer. The common man is going to suffer because of the stupidity of that one percent that is under this delusion that it owns the world and the common man is going to suffer hugely as they already are suffering hugely uh, but at the end the destruction the total annihilation the total destruction will be of that very one percent that has been inciting and financing and egging on this world war. So yeah, um, Palestine is going through hell and all those people in the Western world, the public, who are displaying their ignorance by still supporting Israel, I have only one thing to say, and this is one thing I've said right from the start. If you really, really support Israel, then you should give your land to them. It was Europe that persecuted the Jews and threw them out. And America at that time also refused to take the Jews in. And then suddenly, as a compensation, they're like, oh, you know, there's land, Palestine. Why don't you go and settle there? No, no, no. If you, if you really, really sympathize with the Jews, if you really support Israel, then you need to give them your land. America is a huge place. Israel can actually be created in any one of the states of America very easily. It is America's duty and responsibility to give a part of its land to Israel and call it Israel, okay? And again, Europe. It's also Europe's duty. So America and Europe, you need to decide. America, Europe, Australia, Canada. Any one of you amongst yourselves, you can decide who, you know, which one of you wants to give your land up to Israel. Because by all rights, by all laws, and by all levels of responsibility, you are the ones who owe Israel a land. So yeah, I mean, don't just, you know, verbally sympathize. Don't just verbally support Israel. If you really want to support Israel, give them your land. Now where's everybody? Why is everybody silent now? Are you all dead now? Why? It's just easy to verbally support them, give them some money, you know? but you don't want them to come and settle amongst you? I mean, I thought you supported Israel. Let them live with you. It's not that bad, is it? It's, an, it's an actually an ideal situation. This is me signing out. Khuda Hafiz.